Good afternoon, uh, Craig Lapsley, and I'll introduce uh, Chief Health Officer Rosemary Lister with me today, and also uh, the CEO of EPA, uh, John Merritt. Uh, just a bit of an introduction, uh, it's important to reflect on uh, where we are in Gippsland. Uh, Hazel, the Hazelwood uh, mine fire is one of the critical fires, but we should also remember that there's fires in East Gippsland. And the East, East Gippsland communities north of Albost, uh, Goonga in the Tubbett area, have still got uh, fires burning. And although the whole area is not burning, it's still a fire of significance that, uh, that CFA, DEPI, uh, resources from New Zealand are still in the country assisting us to, to manage that fire. So I think that's important, although for the Moorwell community, certainly the Hazelwood fire is the number one issue. Uh, Hazelwood fire, as we know it, is still burning. Uh, yesterday, uh, a day of significance with wind and temperature, uh, and firefighters have done a great job. Uh, not a lot of gain was yesterday, but we knew at the start of the day um, that may be the case, that the, the weather conditions would put pressure on uh, the firefighting uh, resources and how that would be achieved, but they've done a great job to hold it to where it is. Uh, we're still running uh, 200 plus firefighters in every shift, uh, committed to what they're doing uh, in, a, in very difficult circumstances. MFB, CFA, South Australia Metropolitan, uh, Fire Rescue New South Wales aren't down at the mine but are in Morwell and Trelgan and other provincial cities providing support to CFA. Tasmania's here, airport firefighters out of Tullamarine and East Sale. Uh, really important to understand the airport firefighters' effort with their uh, large machines. And yesterday we were challenged again where a fire came out of the mine. Uh, it was a grass fire that put significant pressure on the Hazelwood power station. It went within metres. Uh, an extremely good save by firefighters, an intense time, uh, a very significant save. It, re it required closing down conveyor belts that were threatened by fire and had fire under them, which means that the power station was reduced by 20% of its power for a number of hours, uh, but didn't have any impact on um, demand and supply across Victoria. But as a precautionary measure, required the conveyor belts to be closed, which means the, the power generation station itself was uh, reduced in its output. Uh, a very good firefight. Um, that, that in itself meant there was a plan of strike teams being pre-positioned because the risk was there. They knew the risk was likely. It was about when and where and how to deal with it. Uh, aircraft resources, uh, and I spoke to firefighters this morning that were there, a very difficult um, firefight and uh, obviously a very tense time for our firefighters to make sure that the Hazelwood power station wasn't impacted nor on fire. So that's quite critical. A um, couple of things. Uh, this morning uh, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, the Health Assessment Centre in Moore. Um, good uh, attendance by people, community members, and I had the chance to talk to some of the community members. Uh, they're very pleased that they can uh, get assessment of their level and get that understanding of what it means about some of the potential health impacts, what it means for them and their children. Uh, and I'd have to say um, the, the, the mood, although uh, very focused about their health, was um, a very good discussion. Um, that they want to know what's happening to them, and that's obviously why uh, Rosemary is so critical. Ambulance Victoria, nursing staff that were there, great job. Uh, it's a great initiative, uh, well attended, and we'll certainly look, uh, we've spoken to Health this morning about whether that needs to be expanded in, in some way, shape or form um, to make sure that we cater for any increased uh, needs over the next uh, week or weeks. So that's important. The other one, uh, the respite centre that uh, DHS Red Cross and uh, La Trobe City have uh, set up at uh, the Maui Town Hall, another great initiative to allow people to get respite. One of the important things though that DHS want to have emphasised is the fact there is a number to ring that the, uh, an individual, a family can book a meeting um, to discuss how they may be relocated for short periods of time away from Morville. That number is 1800 006 468. Uh, that allows uh, a phone call to talk to an individual to book a time to have a meeting in Morwell at the DHS office at Morwell to talk about the circumstances and DHS will work through and support uh, that individual or family of how in which they may best relocate for short periods of time away from Morwell and the Valley. This will be particularly important for people that have not got family networks have not got um, family connections and need further support. So that's really important. Um, in saying so, I'll hand over to uh, Rosemary as the Chief Health Officer. Thanks, Craig. Well, I'm, I'm Rosemary Lester. I'm the Chief Health Officer. Well, as you know, the situation now is continuing and we are continuing to have quite poor air quality um, in Morwell. And that's been a very trying and distressing situation for everyone down here that's having to, to live through it and work through it. 
Our priority has been to work with the Environment Protection Authority very closely so that we're talking to them constantly about what the air monitoring is seeing and what that means for people's health. Our focus at the moment is to get the best possible information on the health, on health effects to the people of Morewell so that you can be fully informed about what this means for you. Our priority at the moment is to concentrate on the short-term health effects that we know that the smoke can cause. We know that the fine particles in the smoke can get down into the lungs and that can cause short-term health effects like exacerbation of asthma, um, worsening of, of heart or other lung conditions. And we know that the people who are most vulnerable to these effects are people with pre-existing heart and lung conditions, children, the elderly, smokers and pregnant women. So again, we'd ask you to hear the message that um, you need to stay out of the smoke, if you can, for, for most of the time. If you are able to uh, take, take respite away from a smoky area, if you're able to go and stay with a family, family member or friend out of the smoky area, that's ideal. If you don't have that sort of facility, you're able to attend the respite centre in, in Moe that the Fire Services Commissioner mentioned. You're able to attend there. The staff there are very welcoming. There are good facilities and lots of information for you. There is also the Health Assessment Centre, again, which the Fire Services Commissioner mentioned, so that if you do have any concerns about your health, you can um, drop into the Health Assessment Centre. This is staffed by paramedics and nurses, and they'll do some basic health assessment and screening for you, um, answer any of your questions, and if you do need to be referred on to your GP or the hospital, um, they'll do that for you. We have, we have seen the Health Assessment Centre well, well patronised, and I think that that's been well received in terms of the advice and support uh, that people are getting. In, I, I must stress, though, that, of course, although the, the smoke and the ash is very distressing um, and annoying for people to, to live through, what we are concerned about um, is basically what we can't see versus what we can see. And the carbon monoxide is the, is the thing which we, we would be really concerned about. The EPA is monitoring that constantly for us, and we haven't seen levels rise to, to anywhere near um, a level where we would be concerned. Right to ask questions. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, what about uh, people with, I mean, you're talking about people needing to leave the area. There are a lot of farms here, small communities. We've got animals. The animals are being impacted as well. What's your message to them? Well, if people uh, can't get out of the community, if they, if they need to stay and work, and obviously that's fine, um, people need to stay and work um, and, and do their livelihoods. If people such as farmers, who obviously need to work outside, um, they can avail themselves of a P2 mask if they wish. It is important to note that P2 masks do have advantages and disadvantages, so it's important to note that just putting on a mask is not um, a simple solution. The mask does need to have a, um, a close fit around the nose and mouth to make sure the particles don't get through. If it doesn't have that close fit, well, it won't filter out the particles. Uh, it, is, it is also important that anyone with a chronic heart or lung condition should speak to their doctor before they wear a mask because the mask can be quite hard to breathe through. So, yes, if you do have to be outside, working outside, you can wear a mask. Um, but even, even so, try and take a break inside in an air-conditioned space um, for at least some part of the day. What sort of advice are you giving to pregnant women? Because Ambulance Victoria and police have told their staff if they're pregnant or trying to fall pregnant, they shouldn't be working on this fire. It, we need to be clear that about the distinction between people working on the fire, at the fire front, and the general Morewell community. For officers, be they um, Ambulance Victoria or firefighters on the, at the fire front, the, um, the real hazard there is the carbon monoxide. And it, as you know, um, workers there are constantly monitored. There's constant monitoring in place. And that's because the carbon monoxide hazard is present there. For people in the general Morewell community, as I mentioned before, the carbon monoxide is being constantly monitored across the town and we haven't seen any levels of, levels of concern. So there's no need for uh, pregnant women in the town of Morewell to be concerned about that. We've heard reports of one, one firefighter who said none of his crews were checked for carbon monoxide levels in or out of fighting the fire over these few days simply because they've had too much, on, too much on. It just hasn't happened. Is that a problem? Sounds like it could be a problem. Uh, well, that's a matter for um, the CFA and their Occupational Health and Safety 
uh, people, and I, I can't comment on that. We've been told that there are plans in place for an evacuation should a formal instruction to evacuate, should that be put in. Can you tell us how close the community is to that point of evacuation and at what point you will put those evacuation plans in place? That's right, there is an evacuation plan that's been prepared. Uh, we've talked about the triggers for an evacuation being um, the level of carbon monoxide and the triggers, um, it's, just, it's not just a single spike in a, in a level of carbon monoxide, it's a spike over a period of time. So we need to look at a particular level over a particular um, period of exposure before we would need to think about evacuation. As I said, we are constantly monitoring that and we haven't um, gone anywhere near what we would regard as a level to trigger a talk about evacuation. So is that the only trigger? Are there other factors in terms of choosing to evacuate or is that the only one? That's the only one. What yes. about small particle pollution? We've been, we've been monitoring small particle pollution obviously very closely as well. Um, we're continuing to talk to national and international experts on this to make sure that they're giving us, or that we're getting the, the very best possible advice on this. So we're continuing to, um, to expand our thinking around this. But is there a At, trigger in there for no, small particle? No, there isn't. You say there's assistance for people uh, to get out of town if they want to evacuate. Five hundred dollars, I believe it is, available to them. Uh, but there's so many uh, you know, guidelines for that. If they haven't got a pension card, if they haven't got a health care card. So what about the people who have got businesses, people who are working? Uh, who don't have that card? Well, as we mentioned, there's no. Uh, we don't believe there's a necessity to evacuate. Um, we are saying to people, if you can get out of town for a short period of time, that's fine. Um, the Department of Human Services, as you mentioned, is individually assessing assessing people people's hardship, and if people want to give them a call and work through their individual circumstances, then a Department of Human Services officer can work through and see if there's any assistance that they can provide. You said you were getting advice internationally about the small particles. Are you confident yes. and can you guarantee people that there won't be any long-term health effects as a result of this in years to come? At this stage, this in the scheme of things, although it has been you know, very distressing, um, very distressing to live through, at this stage this is still regarded as a short-term exposure. So there is no evidence of any long-term health effects from this sort of, uh, this sort of smoke and ash um, for this type of short-term exposure. When have gotten to a point where they... people with masks? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Sorry, is the department supplying people with masks or are you encouraging them to go out and buy them? The masks are available through the Health Assessment Centre, through the Community Respite Centre. Uh, they're being distributed by local governments and I believe they're being distributed by um, the CFA. So the masks are readily available. However, as, as I said, um, people do need the correct instructions to, to use the mask. Um, we have written instructions on how to use the mask, which have been given out at the assessment centres. Um, a pictorial re representation of that is also on the website for people to have a look at. We're just the so frustrated now that they're actually saying that they're planning a <coughs> protest and they've got hundreds of people that are planning this weekend to actually come forward. They say that they haven't been informed well enough. I mean, this is two weeks on since the fire first started. What would you say to that? Well, uh, the Department of Health, in conjunction with the EPA, has been putting out health advisories um, since the start of this incident. So each day, a health advisory about the level of bushfire smoke and the health messages that people need to take to protect their own health that's been going out every day. Online. And that's been going out through a variety of mechanisms, through the media, um, through paid media. We've had uh, newspaper advertisements, paid radio advertisements, online, on our websites, and now through printed material through, uh, through the centres. So we have been trying to get the message through to the community in as many, as many accessible ways as possible. What the is the definition? What is over, the... the community meeting over a week ago said that uh, the, the fire will be out in a couple of weeks. Well, just today they're still saying a couple of weeks. So yeah. is, there, is there an actual, you know, instead of saying a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, which is the residents aren't happy with, um, can, you give us a, can you give them a date? Oh, that, that's a question for the fire services commission. Can I ask, you, can I ask yeah. you, what is the definition of short-term exposure to small particle pollution? Are we talking a couple of weeks or four weeks or six weeks? What's your definition? Well, look, that's something that we're continuing to t take advice from national and international experts on. Um, and that's something we'll continue to work through. What is your advice now? My advice now is that this is still in the realm of a short-term exposure and there is no evidence that we have at this stage that there will be any increase in risk for long-term health effects. How isn't that the problem, that, that there is no evidence of anything? Yeah. We just There's just a complete 
knowledge gap on the impact of fine particles. There's some studies coming out of Europe sort of suggesting that there is no such thing as a minimum exposure to PM 2.5 particles. And we've got, looking at the readings, <coughs> the National Advisory uh, limit is 25 micrograms per cubic metre over a one-day period. We're far exceeding that. There isn't a knowledge gap on this. So there isn't a complete knowledge gap on this. We do know that um, exposure to, to fine particles can cause short-term health effects. What we do know is in the sorts of ex short-term exposure that we're talking about, it would be virtually impossible to tease out any slight increase in risk from all of the other, all of the other exposures that we have every day. So it's not possible to say, yes, there is an increase in risk from this sort of this short-term exposure. The yeah. evidence is really not there um, to distinguish it from any other, from walking around a, um, a busy intersection, I intersection in Melbourne, your exposure to particulates from that. But you're That's not very reassuring. Uh, though, is it, you know, this has been an exposure going on for weeks now. It's not quite the same as um, pushing the stop button at a walk. And it's yeah. also, you're also advising people to get out if they can. So surely that's contradictory? No, it's not contradictory. We know that the, the reason we're advising people to get out if they can is that we know that the particulate or the particles in the smoke can, can cause short-term health effects. So that's why we're asking people to take a break from the smoke if they can um, and take advantage of, of the respite centre. Right. So what the effects would be on unborn babies? The, the um, primary concern we have about pregnant women and unborn babies is carbon monoxide because we know that that is um, harmful to developing brains. And as I said, we've been keeping a very close eye on the carbon monoxide and that has not been um, a level of concern, which is good. Rosemary, we've got 600 people coming to a rally on Sunday at 2 o'clock at Kurnow, Kurnow Hall. Are you mm. coming along to that? Uh, no, I wasn't intending to come along to that. Okay. Have you made a visit to the mine? Are to the mine, to I've made several, I've made a couple of visits to Morwell. I've been through Morwell. Um, I went to the, I met the uh, the council in Morwell the other day. I met the council staff. Um, I went flew over the mine um, last week and had a look. So have you walked in the streets of the main street and breathed in smoke. I have. I walked into the um, walked into the uh, the press conference that we had had there last week. I have no problem with being in Morwell. I'm fortunate that I don't have a chronic disease, so I'm not one of the at-risk people. I've got no problem with, with being in Morwell. Um, I do understand that for people who've lived through this for now, um, for the two-week period, that it is upsetting and distressing and can, has that potential to produce those short-term health effects. What about the long-term health effects? Well, I, th I, think we've, I think we've answered that. As I said, we're continuing to talk to national and international experts to make sure that we're getting the absolute best advice and the best advice out to the community on this. How close, just on that, the carbon monoxide levels that will determine whether you evacuate or not, how far off are the, cu are the current carbon monoxide levels from that trigger point? Well, our we first... days or time frame one? Well, we're talking trigger levels. So our first trigger level is 27 parts per million over an eight-hour period. So it's not a single reading of 27, it's a 27 over an eight-hour period. So that would be our first level of discussion. So we would ask the Environment Protection Authority to validate those readings and we would have a discussion about the need to evacuate. Um, looking on the website just a few hours ago, the level of carbon monoxide in Morwell was around three. So that's about what you would see normally in a, in a busy city street. How would you go about evacuating 13,000 people if you had to? Uh, well, that's a matter for Victoria Police. So I know that they have those plans in place. Um, just a, a union rep um, has reported a paramedic, Victorian paramedic, has had a stroke whilst attending these fires. Are you aware of that? What's your response to that? Um, I'm not aware of that, and that would be um, something for the individual's own doctor to comment on, and obviously the, the occupational health and safety um, staff at... at um, did you say it was a firefighter, wasn't it? Was or a paramedic, paramedic. Yeah, yeah. So the occupational health and safety staff... Um, at Ambulance Victoria should comment on that. So those at the fire front, what are the heightened risks for them then? Well, the thing that, that is concerning at the fire front is obviously the carbon monoxide. So the firefighters are constantly monitored for that. Uh, they wear breathing apparatus some of the time. So it's the duty of the employer to make sure that those firefighters and the volunteers are protected. And I know that the CFA put a lot of effort into that program and are having that externally reviewed.
Could you just clarify, Rosemary, um, if two weeks is short-term exposure, when is it going to be long-term exposure? A month, six weeks, eight weeks? Well, that's what we're seeking further advice on. So, as I said, we are um, seeking out national and international experts on this to give us some further advice now that, it's, um, now that we are into the third week. Who are you consulting? Um, oh, look, I don't want to disclose details of that. We'll just we'll seek, out, seek that further advice and, and put our position. Are you seeking um, it or are you getting it? Well, we're seeking it. We're in discussions. It's a little, um, I think it's a little uh, hair-splitting point. Would you say that you're in uncharted waters here with this particular fire? Oh, look, it's, you know, it's very frustrating that it's gone on this long. And that's, that's why I said why, we've, why we have sought further advice. Um, so we'll just see what the advice tells us. Craig, can we just ask you about the actual fire? Um, you said this morning that um, it could actually be a matter of months rather than weeks. Um, I think uh, and there's been a number of questions about the duration. If you have a look at the success so far, and I, I think that's important I say success, we believe we're over 50% of the fire has been extinguished. Yesterday was a critical point in that, in the sense it could have went backwards. If you take that 12, 13 days into it, and you project that out, that's why we're saying it's, it's 14 days ahead of us. Um, if everything goes right, and I've had that reassessed by the outgoing incident controller of, of the assessment of his four days, and he's just turned over and he said, look, I think it is 14 days. We've had the Chief Officer of CFA individually look at it. He said it's about 10 days or a little better. So somewhere in that period, if we get the success rate of what we've had over the last period, we'll get there. However, remember we've got weather conditions next week, Wednesday and Thursday, that bring in, in high winds, temperatures. That will challenge us. That will challenge us. It requires everything going right for us to achieve that 14-day that window. And obviously that's one of the key issues of why EPA and, and the Chief Health Officer, we stand together because it's ongoing. And I think the other thing that's really important here, um, we're working with the community. We're not against the community. We, we want the Morwell community not to have this fire. We want this fire out, but it's challenging to do so. On radio this morning, you seem to be backing down away from saying weeks. You were saying months. Well, potential. it's got the potential. It's got the potential to be that. This is the best case scenario is 14 days. Um, we know, and if you talk to some of the old miners, they'll say there's been fires that have been underground for time. So, so let's, let's be realistic, but our focus is to get 14 days. We're putting the resources in, the work plan's there to get a 14-day um, containment strategy around it, and then it will probably rely on some really heavy rains to put out the, the other bits that are still underground. How did you get out experience do you think the carbon monoxide levels could reach a point of evacuation? Um, I haven't seen yet any trigger that's put it into the, into the uh, triggers um, that would require evacuation. I go back to last weekend, the monitors, the Morwell South monitor, which is the, the one that has had the highest uh, carbon monoxide uh, readings, was peaked at 14 for a short period of time. When I say a short period of time, it took a while to get to 14, it peaked at 14 and went back down. We were, we're relying heavily on the work that's been validated by EPA and the Chief Health Officer. 27 parts per million over eight hours, so dosage and exposure is it, and it goes right up to where it's 420 parts per minute for 10 minutes. So if we had uh, generated that level of carbon monoxide, which we can't see in a science sense of how that would generate that, um, but we've planned for those. The question of evacuation, yes, we have got a plan. In every major evacuation, we do worst case planning. Um, this headquarters here has done that with Big Pole, with the incident controllers, with the regional controllers to say how would it be executed? How would it work? Where's Who's first? Where do they go? Uh, all of those have been worked through and police, uh, that's their job and they do that very well in everything that, uh, that we've ever seen before, whether it be in bushfire, in major structure fires, in industrial fires and the same here. Should the people of Moore will know about that evacuation plan, um, you know, God forbid it never happens, but just so that if it does happen they know what to do? Um, that's a good consideration. Uh, uh, that may be something we do. We've got to be careful we don't scare this community to the point. Let's get focused on the health issues, and I think the health issues are front and centre. Smoke, carbon monoxide and ash. They are the three key things. Um, we've been through the, the, the smoke stuff. Uh, EPA has been very strong on that early. Carbon monoxide, I think we've tackled to the ground quite well. I think we now understand it well. We understand the peaks, uh, how to manage it, uh, dosage and exposure. Uh, I think the ash is certainly still an issue that is unresolved in, some, in many people's minds of what it does. And through Rosemary and EPA are doing the best in understanding the analysis and obviously ongoing analysis. So, so we've got to work with that uh, and understand that the longer this, uh, this dust, this ash falls from the sky, uh, like snow in some areas. I spoke to a resident this morning and he said his backyard was like snow. And he's saying, I, I can live with it, but it's getting frustrating. 
And that's the other point about this is a frustration level. So we can go to the science, we can go to the medical bit, but people are getting frustrated. Um, we, we clearly have engaged with the community. Have we done enough? I'm sure there's someone out there saying, no, we haven't. So we've got to keep at it. What's going to happen with compensation for the people who've had to move out or their houses are all dirty or they can't work or uh, they're uh, losing business in the main street, people are getting out of malls, what's going to happen for compensation? Um, we haven't got an answer for compensation uh, at this point. What I will say, though, is um, the first thing is important that people need to be supported in leaving Morwell, that is for short term, that they do ring the DHS number. I make an appointment and work through the circumstances. And the reason we're doing that is so everyone has got a different set of circumstances and to give them $300 or $400 or $500 may not answer what that person needs. I think that's really important. That is going to be tailored to suit the needs of that individual or the family circumstances. That's one point. The second, just before that, the second one that's really important here is think about government services. Education has already made a decision to close um, or relocate the children out of one school. Uh, early, early, uh, early child facilities have been relocated, those that are, uh, are managed by La Trobe City. Our focus at, and the, the thing there, I believe, very strongly was children to get respite through their normal uh, age, or their, not their, their early children's um, program, was a way to give them respite. So go and be in a different place for those hours they're normally in care. Back in their house at night where they live, um, there isn't the indicators to say that they are under risk of significant health issues, they've got short-term issues and need to be monitored. That's in there. We've now got to expand that. One thing we have to do in Morwell, and it started uh, two days ago, was all of Morwell. It's been focused on South Morwell. There's a broader community in Morwell that need the information, and it was very clear by the City Council meeting on Monday night, we have to treat all of Morwell, not part of Morwell, and that's being worked on now. I guess you're talking about how you know there might be one person out there that feels like you guys haven't done a good enough job, but the indications are from this protest that there are actually about 600 people that want to attend, and obviously you guys are doing the best that you can, but there are a lot of disgruntled residents out there. Let, let's engage with them. I mean, we, we shouldn't be um, hiding, we shouldn't be scared of, we should walk up and talk to the Morwell community. That, that's our jobs. Let's let's talk to the Morwell community. Why are the mine owners hiding? <coughs> they're not speaking, they're, they're just, they've disappeared. Um, my, my answer to that is um, very clearly this is an emergency run by fire. Uh, I have the ultimate responsibility about ensuring that the control mechanism is put in place through CFA, MFB and others. Uh, and the mind, uh, if they need to be here, will bring them here. I'm more than happy to invite them here. They have seen that it's an emergency and therefore the control agency um, takes the lead, is, is the model which works. Uh, if we need to get the mind involved, and we have got them involved heavily in the mine, doing the works they need to do to support the operation, uh, if they need to be here, we can talk about that. Um, but we need to be clear, are they going to add value add to the health discussion and the emergency management discussion, or is it something that can wait later in Not a priority right. sense? Craig, would shutting down the power station very early on, do you think, um, have allowed firefighters to pursue the, the fire more aggressively? Um, I don't believe so, in the sense that where the fire is in is the disused part. Um, people have put to us about uh, flooding the mine. Uh, in flooding the mine, uh, takes out the pumps, takes out the infrastructure that we need to fight the fire. So flooding the mine has been um, considered not the right option uh, to progress where we are today. We've looked at all sorts of options in the extinguishment strategy, and it comes back that water uh, and use of foam and other wetting agents is critical. One thing I will say, I am really concerned about the integrity of that mine. Uh, the more water we put in, uh, one of the constant things we talk about is the safety of our firefighters. And the fact is that as we put water in, we potentially erode parts of it. Uh, that's a key consideration for our people. We do not want a landslide in that mine that buries a fire truck or compromises the safety of the firefighter in any way, shape, or form. Let alone understand what that might do to the infrastructure outside the mine. What do you do to prevent that from happening? How do you prevent that? Um, well, there's, there's people on site to uh, advise us about the hydrology, the, 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 geo the, the geology of the site. Uh, and then to the river site. So it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism. That's why the mines people are actually um, heavily involved in, in the operation under uh, or in the, in the open cut, is to get that right. And is that, is that water that would cause that? Uh, water would, yeah, but also think about uh, as the coal burns, it creates uh, um, cavities. So you've got issues of um, creating cavities or the burnt coal uh, is compromising integrity as well as us supplying water. We've seen fires in this mine many times before. What's different about this one? Because the Morwick election in the 1977 fire was huge. Uh, we haven't seen the same outcry. Yeah. I don't know if you can answer that, whether you were here, but... 
No, unfortunately, I wasn't here on 1976. <laughs> I, I'm younger than you may think. Uh, from that, though... 77, right? 77. Yeah. Still a young person. Like yeah, th- yeah, there is. There is history here. Um, 1944, uh, 1933, 1977, 1982 were major fires that were um, connected to, to bushfire, uh, bushfires, and then we've had others that have been industrial fires. Um, uh, there's some lessons to be learnt about that, and obviously circumstances change, but there's no doubt that the northern batter of this, of this fire, or the northern batter of this mine, is the key issue that puts all of the smoke, ash, and potential hazard over, over what is more. Um, that issue is key and front and centre of the, of the, of the um, extinguishment strategy. Uh, if it's in other parts of the mine, it doesn't offer the same level of frustration to the town, without a doubt. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.